BBS coming up. <laughs> um, we're doing Live in Water Park. So um, our theme is Water Park. We're going to make a splash with Jesus. And we're going to study some Old Testament and New Testament about obedience and how it brings us closer to God. So it is going to be July the 8th, 9th, and then the 10th is a different time because it's a Saturday. We're going to have a family fun day that day. So if you're interested and you're available either one night, all three nights, or that Saturday morning, there's a sign-up sheet down here if you can sign up. We sure would appreciate your help. Invite your family, invite your friends. We just ask that they come in play clothes, that they can get a little wet in. Some of the games might involve each night some um, water at the water park. But we're going to ask that they not wear their swimsuits for obvious reasons. So um, we've got a water slide coming that Saturday. <laughs> Y'all get excited, it's a water slide. No? It's a water slide big enough that us grown-ups can go on. Oh. Yes. It's not the baby one. That'd be great. So, um, just really excited about it. We've got the blessing of the book bags coming up on the 18th of July. School actually starts back on the 22nd. So, this summer, even though it is officially started, it's coming to a fast close for us. So, we're going to pack in as much fun as we can. So, y'all be sure to be on the lookout for more announcements. Thank y'all. Now let's turn our attention to prayer. Uh, let's do a pray for uh, Frank Cakes. He is doing a tremendously better. Um, he's looking, hopefully, going to rehab on Thursday. So that's a good advance. So uh, thank the Lord for that. Um, and uh, also do remember um, Hollis Martin and her family. She is still at the hospice house. And of course, her family, they're supporting her. So do please pray for them as well. Other requests that you have, Gaisha, we just ask you, Lord God, to hear, hear what's burdening our hearts tonight. Dear God, you said to open up to you and let us know, let you know what we're dealing with, not to, not to keep it to ourselves. You said to pray. Pray means to give. Pray means to, to confess. Prayer means to get it out of us and to give it to you. God, you are God. There's nothing you can't handle. There's no person you can't touch. There's no situation you can't remedy. There's no healing that we've prayed for that you cannot fully accomplish. So God, we surrender our worry, our, our feelings of I must be concerned and I must do what needs to be done here. Put it into the sovereignty and the grace of God. And Lord, you will touch those that are hurting because of lost loved ones. Those, dear God, that are on death's door now, that you will be with them and their families as they go through this uh, transition, change together. For those, dear God, that are recovering from death's door, dear Father, I pray that they would understand the grace that keeps them here. And for the power of God that will help them to live, even if life is changed, life finds a way to, to, to have joy, to have peace, and to have meaning because that's what you've given to it. Father, help them in that process. And for those that are struggling physically, dear God, whether they just come through procedures or surgeries, facing them, God, we ask for healing to be done. Healing is not just to make us comfortable. Healing is not so that we can say, I marked that off my list of things I'm worried about. Healing is to bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ. So that, Father, we can be the testimony of the Lord. That not just that person or that person was touched, but I was healed by the power of Jesus. I was made well. I was brought out of this situation. So, God, you've heard the request. You've heard the needs. You've heard the problems. I ask you to meet these needs. I ask you to minister to the people. For, dear God, you're not just this, this person that just comes by, I'll take this, and you go on in an in, impersonal in relationship. God, you care about interacting with us. And Father, what gets us in the gate is do we know your Son, not have we ever received anything from Him. So God, I pray for all that either the faith will begin or dear God, their faith will be strengthened through the prayer request that we're mentioning tonight. And I pray, God, that you'd bless the people asking for prayer tonight. That dear God, they too will receive what they need from God. For they too, they may be pushing their needs aside to intercede for somebody else. Dear God, you know that. So minister to them as well. Meet their needs that their God prays 
may come from their prayers, but also from the, for the prayer itself. And God, we just take this opportunity to give you thanks and to assume rightly that you will handle all things well. So God, we give it to you and thank your name, even in advance, in Christ's name. Seem to be springing up everywhere. Um, what do you do? 
Who do you trust? There's no institutional church. You just can't call Oklahoma and say, okay, what should we believe and how should we handle this? You can't do that. There's no place to call. Churches are everywhere. And there's pastors and the elders that have been put there by, by apostles like Paul. But the, the tide of, of the church moving into a sphere where there's already gods everywhere. I mean, it, the, the Greek and Roman gods, I mean, they're everywhere. They have the market share. You've got the Jewish belief in just God rejecting Jesus Christ. And you've got that religion out there, which is, is all over the globe. And the different areas having their particular gods to, to deal with. And some of those mixing with Christianity to make it more palatable to the people. You've got a lot of problems going on in the church. And John and Jude felt like we need to say something. We need to say something that the churches can pay attention to in a very dangerous environment where you need to believe what John will say is the truth. Not my truth. Isn't that what is said today? It's my truth and it's your truth. It's the Christian's truth and the other people's truth. No, 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 that's not what John's going to talk about. He talks about the truth. It's not how you feel about it. It's not what you want to say about it. It is the truth. And he was the one to say it. Because John was there. John saw him. So it's like us. Let's talk about the sunrise. What do you, how do you feel about the sunrise? Do you really feel there's a sunrise? Do you really feel like we're uh, going around the sun or the sun's really going back? How do you feel about that? You know what? It doesn't matter what you feel. It doesn't matter what I feel. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what I believe. The truth is the truth. If you're wise, you will believe the truth. If you're unwise, you can make up any fantasy you want to and try to try to make everything conform to it, but you're going to have a life that's messed up. Well, some of that I know I'm talking in the science realm, but we're talking about the worldview realm. And for a lot of that, we don't even think about that. Because pretty much everybody here in this room came from the same type of society, the same type of environment where everybody believed the same thing. They might have lived it, but at least they believed the same thing. Everybody went to church, even if they should have gone to church, even if they didn't go to church. You believe that God was in heaven and He was going to judge everybody at the end? And that's what everybody believed. So, so you could tell people, well, you know this is true. Well, we've changed now. Christianity is not the only worldview anymore. And that is your worldview. You believe Christ is the truth. Others do not. People in your family do not. People coming out of school, absolutely. Do not. People going into universities are being indoctrinated into looking at the world wholly differently than you. That's why we're having now armed guards at parent-teacher conferences. Who thought you'd see that in America? Now we're having riots in the street based on, well, I see the world differently than you do, and you need to see the world like I see the world. It's a war. It's, it's, it's a battle. It's a fight. And we are defining ourselves by our urges, by our likes, by our skin color. We're defining ourselves in the most shallowest way possible. And it hasn't ended. We're in a, we're in a, a month, of course, where people define themselves by so-called love. Well, that's not even enough because, the, because the, the, the flag's got to increase because these recently added people are upset with these formerly added people that you don't like me like you should like me. So we need to, I mean, you just got to keep adding. We're, it's like, who is the most oppressed and who, who, can, who can be the most oppressed? Because if you're the most oppressed, you're the best person in the country. We love you better than anybody else. That's the type of environment that's coming from a whole different worldview. They don't believe Jesus is the Christ. They don't believe God made the world. They don't believe that, that what you hold as fundamental truth is true at all. It's a different world. And for some of us, it's a very scary world because we've never seen this before. It's never happened before. And what are we going to do? What are we going to do? People don't even think like I do anymore. Well, John would say, welcome to my world. I'm, I'm in the midst of a little movement that's got maybe a few uh, thousand, hundred thousands of people on the planet of millions. The Greek gods and the Roman gods are the ones that dominate everywhere. There's hedonism everywhere. There's every kind of urge. There's every 
kind of desire. There's every kind of lust. There's every kind of definition. Slavery is legal. The tears of society are the way things are and nothing will ever change. And Roman politics are all that there is. John says, welcome to my world. But 2,000 years later, Rome's gone. Their hedonism's gone. Their cities are gone. Even most of their statues are gone. But the church is still here. John didn't know that would happen. But John spoke what God had for him to say in his generation, believing it would last all generations. And I'm here as his as a successor or as disciple of his disciples going down through the ages, generation after generation, to say, Boy, if you could just see us now, 2,000 years later, the church you saw Jesus Christ form is still alive. And I believe it is well. Not because of us, but because of the foundation. It hasn't cracked. It hasn't moved. You don't have to go call Ramjack to, 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 to handle this foundation. It's still just as solid as ever. And no body, no movement, nothing has been able to move it. It is still a thorn in the world's side. They'd love for it to be gone tomorrow, but no matter what they do, they can't move it from the centerpiece of history. So in that regard, let's look at what John said in his second and third letter. And then Jude's going to get a little more, he's going to get a little more preachy. <laughs> he's, he's, he's one of those old, 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 first century um, hellfire and brimstone preachers. Because that's what he's going to talk about. He's going to talk about how many people <laughs> are wrong and how God's going to deal with them. John is a little different. It is a lot like his epistle that we read uh, the past two weeks about love being the center of everything. But I just want you to notice just a few verses here because it sums up all that he says to this chosen lady and to her children. He says in verse 1, I love you in truth. I told you that was important. Not only I, but also all who know the truth. See, he says there is a truth and then there's a world. The world doesn't believe like we do. We believe Jesus is the answer for everybody. Jesus came down in the flesh. He sacrificed himself as our atoning sacrifice. He was raised from the dead. He gives new life to all who call on his name. And he will raise them up at the last day. And they will rule and reign with him forever. John says this is the truth. Now you go to verse 2. He isn't finished. He says for the sake of the truth. Which abides in us and will be with us forever. He says this truth surpasses everything you've ever heard and all you've ever known. It is eternal. Now this is a faith statement. John was no different than you and me. John, don't know where this was, whether he had, he had, he had um, faced all those trials at this point, the boiling and oil, the things that tradition says he had to go through. This was certainly before the Isle of Patmos. We'll get to his last book. But, but John is understanding in the midst of all the trials, there is one solid foundation. There's one truth. Just like the sun rises every day, this truth undergirds my life every day. Truth is something very important. He says it again in verse 4. I'm very glad to find some of your children walking in truth. Truth was very important. Now I'm going to ask you, and this is kind of an open-ended question, but, and a lot of answers, but I just wanted to, to see what you could testify to. What does it mean to walk in the truth? That's pretty important. John's done mentioned it at least three times here. Truth is pretty big. So how do you live by the truth? How do you walk in the truth? Walk in Jesus Christ. Walk in Jesus Christ. Okay, what does that mean? I don't see Jesus. Uh, you should have Him in your heart. Have Him in your heart. Now what does that mean? What does that mean to have Him in your heart? We're getting to some good stuff here. Uh, to have him in your heart is to surrender your whole ah, being to him. You just said a big word there. You said surrender. Surrender to who? To Jesus Christ. You surrender to Jesus. So I anticipate that you're saying that he's got a voice, he's got a will, and you are to surrender yourself, your will, your desires to his will. Right. Oh, good stuff. Somebody else. 
walking, loving in truth. By the word. We've been given a word. So what, are we, what should we do with that word? Follow it. Follow it to the letter. So you think they didn't throw any fluff in there. You mean you're saying every jot and tittle is inspired by God? That's exactly right. But see, I say that because people don't believe that. Understand me. Plenty of Christians, they take, they, they, they talk about, I mean, we could talk about how bad Thomas Jefferson was for cutting out all the, all the um, uh, miracles out of the Bible because he believed that was nonsense. That couldn't have happened. But he's got some children walking around this world. They've cut out portions of Scripture they don't like. Well, I don't believe that. I, I don't believe that anymore. I, I don't live like that anymore. Well, that's true. People don't live like that anymore. Jesus said, whom God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And I know there's a lot of circumstances that come along with that, but the, just, just the, the primary principle there, when we moved away from God intends for me to have one person for life, look what's happened. Look, look at our society. We says, you know, I, I watched a video this past week. Says, you know, the, the the line is the children will always be okay. Well, you've had some children, the 60s, 70s. I'm a product of the 70s. Are the children doing okay? How many single parent homes do we have now? Was that God's intention? Never. How many broken homes? How many abusive homes are there now? A lot. How many kids, and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about adoption, because adoption is a, is a wonderful gift that, that God certainly endorses, but how many kids are just with parents that have no biological connection with them whatsoever? They just wanted them, and if they just, and simply, if they want, they go to a bank, get somebody's product, and they work it the way they want to, and this is now my child. So you don't need, you don't need what God says, the fundamental the way that life continues. You can do whatever you want to, be whoever you want to. That's a different world of you. But I have to say, the kids are not okay. And every generation seems to get a little worse as we move from every jot and every tittle. As we move, that's just one realm. You talk about, you know, one thing we don't like to talk about, you talk about um, truth. How about gossip? It used to be gossip that sends you to hell. Hmm. What's that? You've heard that? Absolutely. Well, the Bible says that. But we have we have we have 24-hour news channels now that all they really are is just gossip. And you don't buy it. You don't listen to it. You don't let it affect your life whatsoever. Yes, it does. We move away from it, and so now. We're angry all the time. We're upset all the time. We seem to be always poked by somebody all the time. Why? Because the truth is not what matters. For all society says again, let's just deal with the subject of truth. Well, truth matters. All of a sudden, science matters. Truth matters until what's that? What's what's that thing growing in that woman? Oh, well, that's just that's just a clump of cells that has no life whatsoever. Really? That's what science says. That, that clump don't have a heartbeat. That clump don't have its own individual DNA. That clump doesn't breathe. That, that clump doesn't, doesn't have a brain. It doesn't have any of it. It's just a clump of cells. And it is a baby if the mama says, I want a shower. But it's not a baby if she goes to the doctor and says, I don't want this thing in me. That science? That's not science. It's the lack of the truth. Let's just say it. I either want my baby or I want to kill him. Just be honest. I mean, let's just be honest. If, if you want to, I at least could appreciate your telling the truth. But no, it's a, it's a fetus, which is Italian for, for little life. Duh. I mean, come on. I mean, not Italian, Latin for, for little life. I mean, we are, we are trading the truth, as the Bible said, for a lie. And we want preachers to tell us that lie. We want politicians to tell us that lie. We want everybody to believe a lie. And when everybody believes the lie, then it becomes the new truth. How foolish are we? Just because the Chinese says the people vote all the time don't mean they really do. Just because the, 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 the president and what Venezuela said he got 100% of the vote, do you believe that? I mean, come on. The truth doesn't matter. 
to John, the truth was everything. This is not what I've heard. This is not even what I believe. John said, this is what I saw. This is what I know. And you need to believe what I have shown you as the truth. That's why he wanted apostles. He wanted apostles that walk in the truth. That means what the Bible says, what Christ has put in our hearts that we've, we've had from these two, two, two descriptions. That's how he wants us to live. Tradition wants to tell us how to live. The tradition should come under the scriptures. That's what Jesus said. Jesus had a problem with the traditions. He didn't have a problem with his father's law. He just said, you've changed the law of God for your tradition. Same thing for us. We want to say, I know better than you, God. Really? Go ahead and create it. Well, our founders said God created this country. And look what we've done with it in 200 years. Who's done the better job, God or us? Because we've made a mess. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't want my kids growing up in this mess because I won't see how bad it gets to play with them. Truth matters. It matters. And we can never stop saying it. But truth is not only us walking in it, because sometimes we, we undercut our own argument when we say, this is what you ought to believe, but it's not what I believe. Discernment's very important. But I think it's, it's, it's people who don't believe the truth. They, they preach it in the pulpit, but then they go out and live the opposite. You find out about it. That undercuts the truth. And we talk about how, how horrible all those preachers. Yes, they are. They got 10,000 just like them sitting in the pews. Because you don't know because they never stand in the pulpit. So they can hide their sin much easier. It undercuts the truth. He says, I don't want you speaking the truth. John's not do as I say, not do as I do. John said, walk in it. Live it yourself and then let everybody see. That's the principal promise of the life of Jesus Christ. And part of that, coming, coming to the really the end of what John is saying in this letter... He says in verse 6, no, verse 5 and verse 6, here's the new commandment which we've had from the beginning of Christianity. Jesus gave us, laid it out, this major commandment. What is that major commandment? Love one another. So I'm not here to tell you I'm better than you. I'm here to tell you Jesus loves you. Without Him, you'll never know love. You'll never know life. And people don't. They spend their lives online as if that's a life. But it's as fake as their profile. It's not real. And they're miserable. They can't stand life without it. They, they can't dysfunction. Take, take their devices away from them for a month. By the way, just prepare your way. I'm looking for a digital fast for the church. We've got 40 days to come. So, ooh, we're going to have all, we're going to all have some fun together to see, to see how much. Our electronic media has gotten a hold of us. And how much it's become an idol for some people. Take it away from them for a while and we'll see how much life they really have. It's not there. We are supposed to love one another. And again, the, the world says the same thing. We ought to love everybody. Do they? No. They love the people who are exactly like they are. But they hate it. They call you that. You are the hater. But, but you hate me. I don't hate you. But you're the hater. And they're angry. And they're upset. Why? Because they don't know his love. They've taken his word. And they've caused it to mean something else. He says, here is, here is the, the center part of our life. That we love one another. And we've got one more love that we're supposed to um, follow as well. There's not just one command of love in verse 6. What is love? We walk according to His commandments. Walk is a synonym for live. It's not what I believe. It's not what I think. What does He say? Now, that certainly, there takes some spiritual discernment in there. Some learning, some growth. But He means for us to follow. I don't believe there's anything in the Bible we can write off. And there's some passages in there that's a real head scratcher for me. Lord, what in the world? But I don't get to write them off. Not my book. I don't get to say, well, that don't apply to me. It's not my book. It's his book. And he says, every word is inspired, so I have to take it seriously. I have to do something with it. 
I never have the luxury of throwing it away. And not only do I need to know it, I have to walk in it. That's important. I went to school with many preachers. I, I'd, have to, I'd have to think it out, but maybe, maybe only half of my graduating class are still preachers. It's a lot easier to get up easier to get up and tell other people what they ought to do. It's a lot harder to walk in. Walk according to his commandments is the call. Not just for preaching, but for preachers who follow the truth. And the reason why he said this in verse 7, because many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus is coming in the flesh. Hello, John. We're right back where you were. So, congratulations, America. We've gotten to where they were 2,000 years ago. How's that for progress? I've noticed that as well. It seems like the more the Western world turns against God, we go back to what we used to be. Tribal. Violent. Disparaging of one another. It's, it's, it's supposed to happen because you've rejected truth and rejected life. So, what do you have to go back to? Deceivers are out there in the world. They don't acknowledge Jesus is coming in the flesh. Many, don't, don't, don't let your kids take comparative religion, please, unless they're very strong in the faith, because I can almost guarantee you it's not going to be fair, and Christianity is going to get dumped on all throughout that class. Because it's not about really comparing. It's about saying, all of Christians are just wrong. Believe anything else. In, in our society right now, it's better to be a Muslim than it is to be a Christian, because those Muslims are peace-loving people they took down two of our buildings. Christians, man, you're the terrorists. Really? Once you leave the truth, anything is possible in your mind. Anything's real if you want to believe it. But the truth matters. Deceivers are out there. They're in the church, too. Um, one time we had, it, when we were at Trinity, we had, uh, we had a pastoral change, and I was, uh, was looking for preachers. <laughs> If you remember that one, there are some interesting people that come off the street wanting to pastor a church. Let me just say that. Um, I know conferences and all those issues have, have things that are far from perfect, but the people that walk off the streets that think they're capable of pastoring a church, oh, it's a horror story. It is really a horror story. Deceivers are out there. And you think, well, they'd have to get up and they'd have to be false and, and they'd have to do a hello? Have you ever met politicians? <laughs> they don't mind being false. They don't mind saying one thing one, one day and the exact opposite the next day. As long as it fits what they're getting to, nobody ever calls them on it. It's all just partisan warfare. Don't you think politics has ever invaded the pulpit? Or our, or our communities? Or our little society? Certainly they have. Deceivers are out there, so it's all the more important that true believers walk by the truth. Let's, let's, let's take that and move it on to the next page, to 3 John. Same type deal here. He loves Gaius in verse 1, in the truth. In verse 3, he says, I'm glad when brethren came and testified to your truth. How you are walking in truth. John's consistent here. You're walking in the truth. That's what matters to him. And, and I... I can't totally think of that now, but sometimes it crosses my mind. Maybe it does to you, parents, grandparents, and stuff. If you're on your deathbed and your children or grandchildren are coming, what are you going to say to them? What are you going to tell them? I hope you're not going to say, Will you just be a good girl or you be a good little girl? Well, please don't say that. Please. Because they could wholly define that differently. Cut out all the clutter. Get to the most essential thing that you can possibly say, acting like I only have a few breaths and I'm going to make every one of them count. I had a great grandmother that did that to me. I'll never forget it. Because I took it seriously, not only because it was her, which of course added a layer of, of authority, but that she had to tell me this before she left this world. It's that important. John is reaching that point. 
John's not just saying, well, I hope you enjoy your life. I hope you're prosperous. I hope your children grow up to love you and, and do it. John says, I want you to walk in the truth. I want you to know the truth. I want you to have nothing else but the truth. And if this is my parting words, and these were his parting words, because really the book of the Revelation is not really his book. He's simply testifying what Jesus is going to do. Here's John saying in his last personal letters, all that matters is that you walk in the truth. He says, I'm glad. I have no greater joy than this. Think about that. John says, I don't care if you're poor. I don't care if you're a slave. I don't care if you never reach a level of society where you're comfortable. I don't care. What he says, what, what makes me happier than anything else is to know that my children walk in the truth. So for my last words... I don't think of anything better I could say. I can't say of anybody, but I can tell them as I'm dying, walk in the truth because there's no other way to live. No other way to live. That's John's saying. I love his spin um, on, on verse 2. Isn't it interesting how this is almost flipped? Totally flipped. How many, I don't know how many of you use YouTube, I'll ask how many channels would you imagine are on media, let me just say media, dealing with health or diet? How many channels do you think? <laughs> Some of you say, oh my goodness, I can't count that high. <laughs> I see the look on your faces. So you mean it's a lot? Is it a lot? How about throwing sports there? Did we just not include a whole lot more? Almost, could we say it reaches maybe 75% of content, perhaps? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. There's a whole lot about physical activity, physical well-being, physical health. There's a whole lot of that stuff out there. Now compare that to how much is about soul health. That is much? No. Not possible. There's a lot out there because media has a lot. But look at what John says here. He says, I pray that you prosper and be in good health. And our society says, oh yeah, even church, oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. I want to prosper, I want to be in good health. He ties it. He says, I want it to be to the level that your soul prospers. How much money would be in your bank? If your soul will take it as a man. Your spirituality said how much health you were in. I think we'd be sicker. I think we'd be quite impoverished. He says your soul matters more to me than your physical well-being. Your soul matters to me more than how much you prosper. We say, I don't really care about your soul. If you've got enough money and you've got, a, you've got enough health, man, you're happy. It's all you need. No, it's not all you need. Your soul is what matters. We have departed from this. Even the Greeks understood this, who were the top of athleticism, who, who had all these cutting-edge technologies and medicine for their time. You still had Plato and Aristotle who's talking about the internal workings of man, philosophy that we still study thousands of years later because it's not just about the outer man. It's about the inner man. And while they didn't come up with solutions, both of them committed suicide. Boy, they certainly didn't find life. Jesus Christ came along in the fullness of time and says you don't have to look for the logos, the word, the thing that everything revolves around anymore. I am. You know what? That still works 2,000 years later. It's true. And it should be our standard for everything. He again, like in, like in the other epistle second, he says he worries about those that are um, not of the truth. He says, I like what you're doing to your brethren, especially when they are strangers. You love them. You're doing well. You ought to support them. But, but, Verse 11, don't imitate what is evil. Because in those previous verses, there are deceivers out there. There are 
people who love, who don't accept what he said, they, they, um, I would call attention to the deeds which this particular one has done. He does unjustly, accusing us with wicked words, not satisfied with this. He does not receive the brethren and forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of church. He's a deceiver and he's acting on his deception. And John says, don't imitate what is evil. Imitate what is good. You never need to get anything from the devil. So we don't need the programs of the devil to help the church grow, do we? We need to let God teach us how to grow a church because he did it just fine. He did it just fine. And that truth endures to this day. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil is not seen. You don't know him. Not truly know him. John emphasizes that in his, in his two epistles. Now it's Jude. Jude has the same flavor to his epistle. Though, like I said, he gets a little, he gets a little sterner. What was Jude's main point that he is making? It's in verse 3. It's one that should be highlighted because it is as important then, I mean today, as it was then. What is his whole letter about? He says it. He says, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing to you. I mean, this is an urgent, urgent letter. To do what? Contend earnestly for the faith. Stand up for it. Fight for it. Live it. Don't, don't let it down at all. Don't compromise at all. Why? Why would he say that? Why is he it's so important to him? It's the same reason as John in verse 4. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. Feel it. Whatever you feel goes. And they deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Who's Jude talking about? He's talking about the same jokers John's talking about. He's talking about the same people. They're everywhere. Wherever Jude is versus where John is, they're everywhere. I can tell you they're still everywhere. I got into a discussion with, I don't know who I got a discussion with that about. I, man, I'm getting old. Well, we talked about Leroy Jenkins for a while. <laughs> Boy, what a history that was in Greenwood County. That, that kind of ended by the time I came around, but his legacy, unfortunately, long endured after his departure. But he was a minister. Then he was a minister. He brought in ungodly, licentious things. And in doing so, they deny that the reason for a church is to worship Jesus Christ. Whoever could put a bar in a church, God have mercy on your soul. That's all I'm saying. I realize what, what church is just a building. That's like turning the tabernacle into your personal tent. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't want to do that. I don't want to see how God would feel about that either because once it's given to God, I feel like it's given to God. You better not take it back. It'd be like me taking my tithes and say I set that apart and then something comes up. Oh, I'll just take $10 or $20 out of it. I'll make sure. I don't, I, I don't think God appreciates that. I'll be honest with you. Because he sure was strict in the Old Testament. He said, that first belongs to me. He didn't say, oh, just do it how you feel. He said, it belongs to me. And when they didn't pay it, he says, okay, I'll send you out of the, I'll send you out of the land for the number of Sabbaths that you didn't spend doing what I told you to do. So to me, he takes it seriously. So Jude is saying, there are people that are not taking this thing seriously, that Jesus, he's his brother, but what does he call him? I know some people, if they could actually trace their lineage back to Jesus Christ, they'd find a title for them. I am Jesus' descendant, so-and-so. They'd probably throw the reverend in there, too. The right reverend, so-and-so. I mean, they, they do it because they love that title. This is really his brother. He says, not my brother, Master, Lord, Jesus, the Messiah. It's not about me, Jude says. Oh, it's all about him. And he's the center of everything. 
Now Jude is saying, I want to tell you about that. Contend for it yourselves. It is a faith handed down once for all to the saints. He says, understand God's going to have His way with those that pervert His truth. In verse 5, what happened to the people of Egypt? He brought them out of Egypt and the people that He brought out, did they believe? The Egyptians didn't believe. They lost all the firstborn children because of it. It's sad. But what's even worse, how about, those, how about the children of Israel? 20, 20 years old and up? Was it 25 years old and up? What happened to them? Except for two. Except for two out of thousands. Every one of them died. Why? Why did they die? Desert? Nope. Desert had nothing to do with it. Starvation? Nope. Starvation had nothing to do with it. Why? They did not believe. I think this thing is serious. I think we better treat it as serious. It says he destroyed them. Angels did they not keep their own domain. What happened to them? He's kept them in bonds under darkness for the judgment of that great day. God's not playing. We are just think he is. When he comes back, everybody will know he means business. And everybody will be crying for mercy. When mercy comes for those who have chosen unbelief before that day. It says Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, they turned out well, didn't they? They indulged in gross immorality. They went after strange flesh. Sorry, reinterpreters of the Bible. It wasn't because they were bad hosts. God have mercy. Even in seminaries, we got some, we got some religious crazy people. And that's, that's the kind words I'm going to use. I'm in church. God says... They lusted after the wrong things. And God wiped them out because of it. It says in verse 11, oh, and what just saw them more? Those were cities. The cities around them too. He says, as an example of the undergoing of the punishment of eternal fire. Whew. Verse 11. These, these people, who's he's talking about, they've gone the way of Cain. What was the problem with Cain? We don't have many verses on him, so what in the world could be wrong with him? Killed his Greed. Greed is interesting. I think we can find another word for it, though. What, what did Cain do? Out, before, because this started, I think we're, we're talking about, you know, what he did with Abel. And that's, that's a sin, that's bad, but he did something before that. And it wasn't really between him and Abel. It was between him and God. What happened? That was Jacob. No, 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 that was Esau. Cain. We've got to go back early, early for Cain. What did Cain do? First thing he ever did. That we, that's recorded in Scripture. Other being born. He offered a sacrifice. What sacrifice did he offer? Fruit and vegetables. I wonder why. My guess is that's what he wanted to do. That's not what God wanted. He didn't give God what God wanted. He gave God what He wanted to do. I still see that mindset today. I'm going to give God whatever I want to give Him. Whatever I've got left over. Whatever I feel like Him. That's not the way worship works. If we still had a king in our lives and in our country, you don't tell the king what you're going to give him. So in our administration, tell the IRS, here's what I'm going to give you and you're going to be satisfied with <laughs> See how that works out for you. I'll visit you in prison someday. It doesn't work. Because you can't tell the authority what you will give them. Jude and John understand Jesus Christ, He's Lord, He's Master, He's the ultimate authority. You don't give Him the leftovers. You give Him the first. You give Him the best. You give Him all you have. And I do get offended when, when the arts have disappeared from the church. They give it to the world because the world will do this for them. And the world will give them money. But Jesus, you sang for Him in church before you did any of those things. What happened to that praise? Oh, I'll make an album down the road, about 10, 10 albums in. I'll finally give it back to Him. No, it's too late. If you didn't give Him the first fruits of everything you have, then you've missed the entire point. He don't want what's left over. He 
is the authority. He says they've also gone the way of Balaam. What was Balaam's problem? some pretty women and you get them to show a little leg and say we're going to worship God together at these shrines you'll get them hook, line, and sand you know what? that's right they left God who never done anything for them even though they left 40 years of being sustained in the wilderness and they went to that altar just so they could get the lusts of their flesh and their worship all tied up together Balaam died with the wicked ones, and a whole lot of Israelites died too, because God takes it seriously. Korah, what happened to Korah? That's a, that's also another sad story. But you, I'm going to say a theme here. Korah, Numbers, I believe. It's about thirty some odd years, I would say, in the desert. Now they've been walking around. They're they're going to die. The, the death sentence is already on them, and they're just they're a little irritated. You know, some people, when they, when they don't get their way for a long time, they just become bitter or bitter until they just, you just don't want to deal with them all because they're, they're all bitter and nothing else. Well, they're all bitter. And Korah says, who are you, Moses, to lead the people anymore? Who is Aaron to lead the people anymore? I'm a priest just like y'all are. We should lead the people. So they took their little censers. They took their little incense. They knew how to do it. They marched out and said, we're going to be the priests. We're going to be the leaders for God. Only problem was, God said, no, you won't. And Moses, speaking in that leadership voice, he says, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you who God's chosen. If you die naturally, and I thought I threw some fleeces out there. If you die naturally in this world, I'm not a prophet of God. I'm a fake and a phony. But if God does something new to take you out of this world, then you better know who He has chosen as His appointed one. The earth opened up and swallowed Korah and all those associated with him. And the other rebels, fire came out of the midst of God and slew them all. God takes truth Serious. They are following this way. Describes them in a lot of ways. I mean, there is not a good statement about them at all. Hidden reefs means it'll, you'll, they'll crash your boat and you'll never see them coming. They are like waves of the sea. They're all foam. They're no substance. They're wandering stars. You can't depend on them. And it says, verse 16, oh my goodness, they're grumblers. They find fault. They follow after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly. They flatter people for the sake of gaining an advantage. No, we got nobody like that. But Enoch, who we didn't know much about, this is actually extra biblical literature that's recorded something truth because it's made it to the Bible itself. Enoch, who walked with God, God said so early in, in, in human history, he says the Lord is going to come with thousands of His holy ones. You know what he's going to do? He's going to execute judgment upon the evil people. All, Brother Jimmy, you said. All. That means all. That means me. It means you. It means everybody. The king is going to judge righteously. Nobody gets off. Nobody gets a pass. Nobody gets off on, uh, on bail or, or do some machinations. There's no plea bargains. You can get, no, no, none of that. He's going to judge all and He's going to convict the ungodly of all of their deeds that they've done in an ungodly way and all the harsh things ungodly sinners have spoken against Him. Sometimes I, I look at plugged in before I watch anything because it's a Christian site that tells you what's in it. And I'm just trying to say, I don't trust nothing on TV. I don't. We were watching, we were, we were watching, um, what was that old, it was an old 60s show, Ralph 
Route 66. Remember that old TV show? It's old, man. It's all right. I realized it wasn't old enough. And they started cussing. I said, oh my goodness, even in the 60s? Yes. I can't trust them. They always have had an agenda to put their language in there. And I read so many times and plugged in, and I find out, well, it's, it's, they, they misuse the Lord's name several times. And I'm glad they say that. Because you know what? God's going to judge those who have misused His name. I sure do wish they'd blaspheme the name of Satan like they do my Jesus. Because Jesus comes in every cuss word that I know of, every flavor of it puts His name in. I wish they'd do that to the devil. I wish they'd do that to Muhammad too, but you know that would never happen. It's only Jesus. But He's keeping a record. He's the King. He's the Lord. And justice demands all rebellious people who speak against the King. You know what happens. I'm not saying he's out of joy. Maybe some preachers of, of, of my class, maybe they do speak it. God will get those sinners. I don't feel that way. But I take it seriously. Don't be flippant with these things that God has said through his, his servants are important. In the last days, he said, there's going to be mockers and they're going to follow their ungodly lusts. You said America's not in the Bible? Well, there it is, right there. Because America is full of mockers and people who are following their ungodly. Yeah, it's talking about all the heathen nations too. I got it. But unfortunately, we're among them. They cause divisions. They're worldly minded. They're devoid of the Spirit. If you take that into our present context, saying those words that they're devoid of the Spirit brings new meaning to me while a little over a hundred years ago God sent a new fresh dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Not so that the people could say some unknown tongues that we know about or, or get a nice little shout on in the tent. Because to be devoid of the Spirit of the living God is to find ourselves opposite of God. Rebe rebels against God. Notice what He tells us to do. Who are following Him? The truth. Who are contending for the faith. He says build yourselves up in the Holy Faith. He says pray in the Holy Spirit. I'm glad all y'all know how to pray. Because the Bible says you don't. The Bible says you need His help to know how to pray. That's what it says there. Keep yourselves like John in the love of God. Waiting anxiously for the mercy of the Lord Jesus to eternal life. Now, wait a minute, preacher. You said anxious for the mercy. I don't need mercy. I accepted Jesus in my life. Right? Why do I need mercy? Why do I need mercy every day? Right, but why do I need it? Because we're human, so we still act like we don't know God. Yes, we do. Thank you for saying that, because we do. We act like we don't know God. We should, we should claim it. That's the truth. And so we call out for His mercy. But if you never did another thing wrong, you still need mercy. Why? What was the cross? It was mercy. What was Jesus' sacrifice? Mercy. So people come around, I got saved, I don't need nothing. Don't ever forget the cross. Don't ever forget Jesus. Because it was so merciful, it did away with all your sins. But don't discount the weight of mercy. It was more than you could ever pay more than you could ever earn. More than you could ever have by your own merit. You couldn't, no way you could ever earn it. It was mercy. So since we have so much mercy, verse 22, <laughs> have mercy on these people too. I think Jude has painted a very bad picture because he doesn't want people to believe. Well, it doesn't matter what they believe. As long as they're sincere, God will take them in. That's not what Jude says. Jude says there's people going to hell. These people are wrong. They're rebelling against Jesus. You have a responsibility to them. He says, show mercy on them. Some are doubting. Don't let them just say, figure it out. We don't believe in corporal punishment anymore, but I, I, I'll agree with you to some extent. Let's not whip the children. Let's turn some of the parents over our knees and start whipping their hands to say Jesus is not that important anymore. Shame. There are doubts out there that turn into 
lot worse things simply because we don't deal with their doubts. Just throw them away. Others snatch them out of the fire. I forget who the evangelist was. I want to say it's, it was Finney. I'm not quite sure. But I loved his saying. He says, I want God to put me within, within two feet of hell's gates. Why? Because he says, I want to snatch them right before they go in. He says, I want to be the last line of protection. I want to be right there among the worst of the worst, about to dip it. I want to snatch them right there. He's got Jude's heart. We need to pluck them out of the fire. And until they have embraced eternity, oh, you better embrace it. There's hope and mercy for them. Because that's, that's what mercy calls for. And it says, have mercy on them, but have it with fear. Hating even the garment polluted by flesh. We can't save people by telling them they're okay. They just need to add Jesus to their okayness and they'll be more okay. Their sin is bad. It needs to be said that. And I'm glad Sabrina said what she said. Have mercy on people like that. But don't say you could be a Christian drug addict. Don't say you can pursue a homosexual lifestyle and follow Jesus. Don't say that. The Bible says, hate the garment stained by the flesh. It's still sin and it'll corrupt you too. It'll corrupt the church too. It's amazing how many people were against so many things until it happened in their family and all of a sudden they're for it. So I guess your family is now more important than the truth of God. These are troublesome times, but it's not different than this first century. But the truth sets us we have to contend for it, though. This a book I never want to read, and I'm closing. If you have a comment, you can, you can read it. I, there was a movie made of it, I believe, called Silence. No way I could ever see that movie, though there's probably some merit in seeing it. It's, it's brutal. It was, it was Catholic missionaries that, that had gone to Japan um, in the imperial days. And they were working, of course, the Catholic Church, far from perfect. Um, a lot of politics and stuff we could talk about, but they were doing their devout best to reach people there. But um, a lot of, unfortunately, our missionary efforts brought the Western world into too many nations, and that caused problems. So Imperial Japan got tired of it, and they slaughtered it. Or what they first did before they slaughtered the, the, the um, um, before they slaughtered the Christians, that the Christians in that area, they would take the priests and they would torture them. And if that didn't work, they would torture their disciples until they recanted the faith in front of them, stepped on an image of Jesus, and said, I deny him. They'd have to do it yearly to keep the people. You say, man, that's evil. Yeah, that's bad. Yeah. It also worked. Christianity is still a, my, a, a super minority in Japan. Most of it is absolutely godless. Can I tell you? Godlessness works. You say the faith can overcome everything? Absolutely. Let me tell you, you have to fight for it. You can't lay it there and it says it's going to stand. We laid Christianity down in our nation. It says, okay, we're always going to believe this. We're always going to be the 50s with, with nice homes and nice people. Once we get through the war, we're going to have nice forever. It's 2021. That world's never coming back. It's never coming back. And it's all in our lifetimes. And it's all people just like you and me. Contending or rather not contending for the faith. This, this, these things are still important in our day. Comments before we end I was just share, just thinking about you know, God's word. Contending for the faith is not like we're going to lose. I don't believe that for a moment. But I believe if we don't take it seriously, we'll be like those children of Israel long ago in that desert. One by one, the generations die and it just gets worse. It just gets worse. I don't want to see that. I know where all nations have to end. But I believe the power of Jesus Christ and I believe the power of revival. So I hold out hope for his church. I just got a, a journal series I told, I told my, my Lord about. It came from a guy from West Africa when the Lord is saved through somebody's missionary efforts. God's, God says, okay, now we need to give something back 
because America needs help. I've got a, a set of Bibles that I'm, that I'm collecting right now. comes from those of Asian heritage because God has reached them through missionaries and now they're bringing gospel back in, in a different way. And that to me just shows how powerful Jesus is. It's all over the world. But we it can't say that this religion is the American religion. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to Him. We hold to Him. He is the truth. And that's where I want us to, to center ourselves. I'm going to ask Ms. Reba if she'll dismiss us with a prayer. But for your own family, for your own life, for whatever you do in a community. I just saw an article today that says local involvement is dramatically more important than anything you can do nationally. Well, we can complain about it a lot, but that complaint does nothing. But when we get involved with one person in front of us, or community, or church, when we begin to walk, work in those areas, you can say, and the devil will certainly help you say, that makes no difference. Let Jesus do His work. It makes much bigger difference than 